Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jennifer Apple and Tasha Fiava? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Jennifer Apple and Tasha Fiava lived in Honolulu, Hawaii. Jennifer was born sometime around 1968 and had worked as a landscape architect, exotic dancer, and dominatrix. Tasha was born sometime around 1990. The couple met in late 2016 and within a week planned a sailing voyage to Tahiti, which was supposed to take 18 days each way. 26-year-old Tasha did not have any experience sailing. This, in theory, would be compensated by the sailing experience of 48-year-old Jennifer. Jennifer's experience included an incident in 2012 where she wrecked her first boat, which was a 35-foot fiberglass sloop. I'm not sure that wrecking a boat counts as experience, as the word experience is used in that context. But either way, Jennifer now owned a 50-foot sailboat called Sea Nymph. Here's what happened on the journey, according to Jennifer and Tasha. Before departing on the 2,700-mile voyage to Tahiti, the couple loaded a number of items on board Sea Nymph. For example, they had two desalinators. These are devices that remove salt from seawater to make it safe to drink. They had stocked quite a bit of food on the boat, including pasta, rice, oatmeal, beef jerky, and dried fruits and nuts. The couple had two dogs with them, Zeus and Valentine. The vessel was also equipped with an emergency position indicating radio beacon station, otherwise known as an EPIRB. It was in working condition and registered. On May 3, 2017, the couple set sail from Honolulu. That night they experienced a Force 11 storm, which had winds of about 60 miles per hour and waves which were about 30 feet high. The storm lasted three days and two nights. When the storm ended, the couple considered returning to Hawaii because a component of the mast had been damaged. They decided against this move because they believed the harbors in Hawaii were not deep enough to accommodate their vessel. Sometime around May 30, the vessel ran into a typhoon with 100 to 150 mile an hour winds and 40 foot waves. The water flooded the engine compartment and their engine failed. According to the women, at some point, the sea nymph was surrounded by 20 to 30 foot tiger sharks who uncharacteristically engaged in an organized effort to attack them. The sharks were pounding into the side of the boat and rocking the boat from side to side. The couple tried to sail their vessel to Christmas Island, but they said they couldn't land because their communications malfunctioned. They tried to get to the Cook Islands, but amazingly, a white squall appeared and pushed them further west. On October 1, 2017, the women contacted officials on Wake Island when the sea nymph was about two miles away. The couple claimed that they were on the wrong side of the island to be rescued, and they were not able to navigate to the other side of the island due to a swell and winds pushing them west. On October 24, sea nymph was 900 miles southeast of Japan when it was spotted by a fishing vessel from Taiwan. The fishing vessel contacted the United States Coast Guard. According to Jennifer and Tasha, the vessel attacked Sea Nymph when trying to tow it by not maintaining sufficient towing distance, like the two vessels were colliding. In the midst of this attack, Jennifer hopped on a surfboard and made her way to the fishing vessel, where she managed to use a satellite phone to contact the Coast Guard. On October 25 at 10.30 a.m., the USS Ashland, a U.S. Navy dock landing ship, arrived in the area. Jennifer, Tasha, and their two dogs were rescued at 1.18 p.m. The sea nymph was left adrift because the Navy determined it was not seaworthy. The Ashland made its way to Okinawa, and the couple was dropped off. The women were in good physical condition. Their dogs were in good condition as well. The couple gave several interviews and have maintained their unlikely and unbelievable story. They later claim that the alleged fishing vessel attack is what prompted them to alert the U.S. Coast Guard, and they were never lost at sea. Now moving to my analysis. 
did Jennifer and Tasha tell the truth about their adventure? Many people believe that they perpetrated a hoax. There are quite a few problems with their story. I will go through some of the items here. Item number one, not long after setting sail on May 3, 2017, the couple said they encountered a Force 11 storm, which lasted three days. There was a small craft advisory in the area, but that was it. There was no storm. As far as the typhoon that they said they were in sometime around May 30, there was no indication that happened either. In addition, it seems a bit contrived that the first storm would damage their mast and the second storm would take out their engine. So there are two forms of propulsion eliminated by these two storms. Item number two, Jennifer claimed that two harbors in Hawaii were not deep enough to accommodate sea nymph, which is why they didn't return to the island. In reality, the harbors were deep enough, and there are many more than just two harbors available in Hawaii. Furthermore, if they were really in a desperate position, why not get as close as possible and call for help? It's not like they would be invisible if they were a few hundred or a few thousand feet from the harbor. Even if they believed no one would see them, why didn't they get within a few hundred feet and swim to land? Item number three, Jennifer and Tasha claim that they had six different forms of communication on board Sea Nymph, including a satellite telephone, but all of them malfunctioned. They were not claiming that one event took out all the devices. Rather, the devices independently failed due to bad luck. If the probability of one device failing was 1 in 100, and there's no way it's that high, the chances that all six types of communication failing at the same time would be 1 in a trillion. It's not like the tiger sharks grabbed the devices and swam away. Although if they coordinated their attacks like the women claimed, radios would come in handy. Which brings me to item number four. The tiger shark attack story is not likely to be true. Jennifer said that five tiger sharks attacked the boat for six hours. At one point, there were three on one side of the boat and two on the other side. I picture them kind of rocking the boat back and forth with their fins. Maybe one of the sharks is like, hey, did somebody bring a volleyball? According to Jennifer, they were trying to make waves to knock them out of the boat. Tiger sharks do occasionally ram into boats, but they wouldn't do it repeatedly for hours. They would never rock a boat as some type of organized effort, and they would not jump out of the water, as Jennifer described. Also, the maximum length for a tiger shark is about 17 feet, not 20 to 30 feet. Now, one could argue that maybe Jennifer was really bad at measurement. However, later she changed her story to say the sharks were at least 50 feet long, which was as long as sea nymph. I was thinking that maybe Jennifer just misunderstood what the sharks were doing. Maybe they were auditioning for Jaws 5. The conspiracy. Moving to item number five, the Coast Guard said that on June 15, 2017, which was about six weeks after Jennifer and Tasha started their voyage, they contacted a ship calling itself Sea Nymph. At that time, the vessel was near Tahiti. The captain of Sea Nymph said that she was not in distress and they were going to make land the next day. This doesn't make a lot of sense considering Jennifer and Tasha claimed that by this point, the mast was damaged and the engine was not functioning. One would think they would have mentioned that to the Coast Guard. Jennifer later produced a GPS unit. According to Jennifer, it proved that Sea Nymph was nowhere near Tahiti at that time. As it turns out, the data on the GPS did not go back far enough to cover the time that she was talking about. Item number six, officials from Taiwan stated that the position of the fishing vessel was monitored 24 hours a day. At no time did the vessel ram into Sea Nymph or attempt to kill its occupants. The captain of the vessel said that they towed Sea Nymph overnight until the women asked them to stop and call for the Coast Guard. Furthermore, the crew offered the women food, but they refused. Item number seven. As I mentioned, Sea Nymph was equipped with an EPIRB. If the couple had activated it, they would have been rescued quickly. When asked why they didn't activate it, Jennifer said the device was for people in an immediate, life-threatening scenario. She wouldn't want to waste resources when not in imminent danger. She also said that if she knew their calls were not being received, she would have used the device, like she was calling for help on various communication devices without realizing that those devices were not working. Later, Jennifer changed her story. 
She was now saying that she didn't activate the device because it would have alerted the captain of the fishing vessel from Taiwan. And again, she was supposed to be afraid of the captain because he was allegedly attacking their boat. Item number eight, the couple claimed that they had a year's worth of non-perishable food on board Sea Nymph for a trip that was only 18 days one way. Even assuming a round trip and them spending some time in Tahiti, they were a bit overprepared for that duration. Item number nine, when Jennifer was aboard the USS Ashland, she claimed that they were within 24 hours of death when they were rescued. When she was asked to explain why she believed that was true, she said that she was not allowed to answer that as long as they were on the Navy vessel. When considering all the evidence, do I think that the adventure of the sea nymph was a hoax? Yes. In my opinion, it is a painfully obvious and simplistic hoax characterized by a lack of effort to make up a compelling story. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Jennifer was probably a high sensation seeker. She was an exotic dancer. She was into skydiving. And the media released clothing challenge photographs of her featuring a motorcycle. I think what happened is that Jennifer became caught up in the excitement of having a new romantic partner and thought that she would be able to combine that with an incredible sailing adventure. A 50-foot boat is a lot to handle for one ostensibly experienced sailor and one inexperienced sailor. This was an important voyage for the couple. They really wanted it to be successful, meaningful, and pivotal in their lives. They did not want to end up returning to Hawaii defeated. They came up with the story about being lost at sea and the exaggerated situations that they may have encountered during their voyage, like bad weather, sharks, navigation difficulties, and mechanical problems. Perhaps they were hoping for a book contract, a movie deal, or some type of attention. When they decided it was time to be rescued, the fishing vessel from Taiwan was the first ship that stumbled upon them. After being towed overnight, the couple realized that this wasn't the magical ending they wanted to their story. They wanted the U.S. Coast Guard to rescue them. They wanted to have a chance to get in front of the American media. They fabricated the story about the fishing vessel crew trying to kill them, and they contacted the Coast Guard for help. When the Coast Guard contacted a Navy vessel to show up, the couple was fine with that too. When they were interviewed about their experiences on the Navy vessel, the couple was overly gracious. They were amazed by everything that the crew did for them. It was really way over the top. Like at one point they were talking about how incredible it was that the Navy sailors gave them glow sticks. They were trying to be extremely grateful, hoping that the Navy would not report the inconsistencies in their story. It didn't take long before Jennifer and Tasha were exposed. Now the dream was over. They were so utterly unconvincing in the design of their hoax that the interest in the case was enough to embarrass them but not enough to make them notorious. Not only were they unsuccessful at being incredible survivors of an ocean adventure, they were not even as popular as other people who perpetrated a hoax. Jennifer Apple wrote two books about the adventures of the sea nymph, or at least it was a person who identified themselves as Jennifer Apple. One book told the story of the voyage, and the other book was essentially an attack on the media outlets that covered the story. It's like just a list of statements and screenshots that refute the media reports. The books are disorganized and bizarre. They don't successfully refute anything. Although I guess if somebody accused the author of being a good writer, the books would refute that. Essentially, the author's defense is that this was a big conspiracy. Everyone was in on it. The Navy, the fishing vessel from Taiwan, and the media. The books are so ridiculous, they can cause secondhand embarrassment. Now moving to my final thoughts. Staging a hoax is a tricky business. For a hoax to attract a lot of attention, the story must be somewhat believable. People have to look at it and think, I wonder if these people are telling the truth. The sea nymph hoax is completely unbelievable. Like this couple was so disconnected from how people critically evaluate stories, they could not generate one that was believable. I think the quality of a hoax is related to how people feel about the perpetrators being punished. The more people that a hoax deceives, the more that society wants to punish them. For example, Sherry Papini, the California resident who falsely claimed she was kidnapped by two Hispanic women, Jesse Smollett, the actor who claimed that he was the victim 
of a racially motivated attack, or Richard Haney, the perpetrator of the notorious Balloon Boy hoax. When a hoax does not deceive anyone, like the C-Nymph hoax, people simply feel sorry for the perpetrators. Jennifer and Tasha did not even rise to the level where they can be thought of as manipulative. Rather, they simply came across as pathetic and desperate for attention. Even the tiger sharks don't care about how this couple defame them. Rather, the sharks just want to move on in peace and practice for their upcoming movie. Those are my thoughts on the case of the sea nymph. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.